Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And today I have two very special guests who happen to be brothers. We have Dominic Lanza and Vince Lanza, who are body techs at Serpentini Collision Center in Middleburg Heights, which is a brand new, sparkling, amazing 50,000 square foot collision center. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. And so when you had your open house, um, I want to say a month ago or so, maybe longer, time flies, yes. I met you guys, and I was just so impressed. You know, intelligent, handsome guys. I'm just going to lay it on here, guys, okay? Um, we'll take it. Intelligent, smart, nice, great professional guys. Thank you. And, um, I, and then you told me, we're brothers. And then you said, your dad works with you. And I was like, oh, my God, this is great. And I remember saying... How cool is it to have dad who's, you know, probably got 30 years or more in the industry and you guys are, you know, young but not spring chickens. I mean, you're uh, uh, Vince, you're 30 and Dominic, you're 28. Um, but, but you have your dad to go to in the shop if you have an issue, a problem you run into with a repair. Uh, and conversely, maybe, uh, maybe you guys have a certain skill aptitude that, that he isn't so great at and he can come to you. I don't know if that's how that works. It but, is. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, tell me about the dynamic with working with your dad. So it works out pretty well. Uh, like you said, um, we go to him with a lot of questions because he's solved just a lot of problems before in the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's great to have that knowledge with you mm -hmm. at all times. And, um, and then we help him with, uh, I, I help him with the door handles a lot. <laughs> There's yeah, a lot, that? Uh, there's a lot of different mechanisms in the door handles yeah. to take them out, and every uh, make and model is slightly different. So, yeah. so you're the door handle specialist. I'm the door. He handle is the door handle specialist. specialist. <laughs> Anyone in the shop comes to me. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Dominic, you gotta help me with this door handle, and I'm yeah. the guy. Yeah. I'm like especially the Audis. Yeah, the yeah. Audis are the BMW door handles. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, we do a lot of bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Um, I help him with something. He helps me. For him, most of the time is. Hey, on these newer cars, how does it come apart? He knows how they come apart, yeah. but it's just the little things. Hey, they move this bolt, or hey, it's behind yeah. this now, and stuff like that. And Or, hey, help me put this bumper on, truck bumpers. Nobody wants to lift the truck bumper and put it on themselves, especially trying to line it up. You don't want to scratch the fender or the bedside. Nobody wants to do that by themselves, and I don't want to do that by myself. Yeah. Or I'll ask him, like I was pulling sway out of a, a ram, Last week, I had to put a, the rail horn section in the front section. And it's been a while since I pulled its way out of a truck. And I haven't used that measuring system in a long time because we have a new spin easy touch. I was using the Chief or the Genesis. And I pulled this truck probably 12 to 20 mils just to get it in square. And he learned on that system for 20 plus years. I haven't used it in probably three. Hey, look at these numbers with me. I know what's good. Everything lines up just because it's a new fresh set of eyes on the system. And we do that all the time. Hey, yeah. I've been staring at this for a long time. I do it to Dom too. Yeah, Dom, take a look time. at this yeah. real quick. And he comes in and goes, oh no, you need to do this, or no, it's good. And same thing for him, for me. How many years does your dad have in the, in the business? He started when he was 18. So he went to vocational school for collision repair at the local vocational school Polaris, but they don't have collision anymore and they only have mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so he started at a small shop when he was 18, fresh out of high school, and they chased him out of the shop because he was too efficient for the guys that were there. They were all hourly. Yeah. So he, and so was he, but he's like, I'm not going to drag my feet. I'm going to work and continue to work. And they're like, you have to go somewhere and be on flat rate. <laughs> yeah. So then he ended up at Merrick, which then got bought by Serpentini back mm -hmm. in 89. So, yeah. And he's been there ever since. So he has almost 40 years experience. How much experience do you guys have? I have 14. 14. 14. Yeah. Wow. I've been there 10 years this year. Okay. And so you're the door handle specialist. What are you a specialist at? <laughs> I am the structural guy in the shop. Okay. You nice. name it, I've done it, I do it. Any, any train wrecks that look like they should be totaled, but based on the threshold, they're not. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of replacements, but I also do a lot of heavy repairs. Mm -hmm. It all depends on the construction material of the vehicle and how the procedures play out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the reasons I was impressed with you guys is how young you are and seemingly thriving in this industry and, and being successful and making a lot of money. Talk to me about your experience so far. You know, is it a good career for you? Are you making the bucks? Is it satisfying 
from a stand from from a standpoint of uh, you know doing a, a, a good job, uh, a job well done, and, and and taking care of the consumer and putting safe vehicles back on the road. Tell me about your experience in the career in the career so far. Um, I love it. I love fixing the cars. I enjoy. It's a puzzle. Yeah, it's exactly what sure. it is. You come in, you get a car, truck, car, SUV, doesn't matter. That's destroyed, and we have a triage department, so we don't get the car damage assembled. We get it torn apart, proper estimate written, and it's, hey, how'd this car come apart? How's the damage? And repair it properly. Uh, just seeing the vehicle um, when it comes in, you know, you see it come in through that estimating bay that we have, and uh, seeing, you know, sometimes you see the customers in there, and you always see them on the worst day of their life. They just got in an accident. They don't know what's gonna happen. They're not sure about their car. And um, and then fast forward to that day that you know you're driving the car into the cleanup department, and it's all nice and it's all shiny and it, it's a real sense of satisfaction. Yeah, getting that yeah. back to the customer. So as you guys know, uh, this industry has a huge crisis on its hands: the tech shortage. Uh, the skilled trades in general uh, are having a tough time attracting young people. Um, what would you say to your peers, uh, your 20-somethings, your friends, your family that are, or anybody out there who's in their 20s uh, and contemplating uh, what they want to do with the rest of their life, whether it's vocational school or college, what would you tell them about, you know, why they should, you know, give Collision a try? It's a new challenge every single day. You're never doing the same repair twice, basically. Everything is different. And it keeps you on your toes, and you, yeah. yeah, you you grow and you learn with the industry as it progresses, and you grow, grow and you learn with every new make and model that comes out. So, for me, I can't sit at a desk. I'm always fidgety. I want to. I'm hands on. I like to know how things come apart, go back together. I was supposed to be an engineer, but I couldn't sit still. So, <laughs> for people who want to learn how to fix cars and want to do something in the industry or in a trade, being able to not go to college and learn is something that anybody, almost anybody can learn, mm -hmm. you know? And you have to have an open mind. You can't say, this is how it's done, this is my way, we still, to this day, um, learn new things. We take advice from other people. Mm -hmm. We're not stuck in our ways because I didn't design the car. I'm not the engineer. I try to do it how they tell me to do it, or I ask for help so I can do it correctly. Um, people getting into the trade, a lot of people who get in the trade, the money's there, but it is, it's the long game, but it's the mid to long game. In the beginning, you're gonna suffer because you know you have to build your tools, you have to learn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to do the work that not a lot of people wanna do. You're the low man on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. But as you learn and you grow, you get better, you get quicker, you get faster, and everything becomes easier. Mm -hmm. um, my mantra is, Dom, it's the same. Slow down to speed up. If you take a second to look at everything, review it, okay, and plan. Instead of rushing into something, mm -hmm. you don't have to backtrack. Mm -hmm. And for people coming into the industry, that's something that a lot of these younger kids need to realize that just because you're getting paid flat rate mm -hmm. doesn't mean you should try to beat the hours on the sheet. You should try to make it done right so from the next time you beat the hours on the sheet because you know you're going to do it right the next time. Interesting. And you mentioned learning and training and that you're not stuck in your ways. And that's interesting because we hear in this industry a lot that if you're a 20, 30, 30 year tech, that they, they tend to think that they know everything yeah. and they don't need to learn or train anymore. And we know these vehicles are not your father's and grandfather's vehicles anymore. They're like, they're rocket ships mm -hmm. yes. with more code than an F-15, right? <laughs> um, so it's interesting that you say you're not stuck in your ways. Um, so do you envision down the road when you're a 20, 30 year old tech, will you say, I know it all, or you know what, I've done, I've been doing this a long time. I know what I'm doing. Or could you, it, it, you cannot be in that mindset. Yeah. I would like to say that, um, 
uh, when we go to repair these vehicles, there's a lot of uh, factory specifications and factory procedures that you would follow. So, you know, if you're a 30-year tech that would like to do it the old way, um, you still need to follow the factory procedure of how the manufacturer wants you to put the vehicle back together. So that, that and along with um, ICAR training classes with the new materials and the new products and the new way of putting the vehicles together, that um, those help you get that done. And every year when there is a new new model coming out, a new make or new model on the manufacturer from the OE, that um, a, let's just say, a 2020 Traverse repair, the old body style, could be completely different from a 2024. Mm -hmm. The old body style, don't quote me on this, you could repair the rails. Mm -hmm. The new body style, you got to replace the rails fully. If there's yeah. a buckle, mm -hmm. you're replacing the rails. In order to replace the rails, you're sacrificing the core support, the apron extensions, sometimes even the strut towers. And how would you know that unless you looked up the procedures, right? Correct. So exactly. I'm assuming, you guys mentioned OEM procedures. I'm assuming that's the kind of shop you are. You, 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 you look up the procedures, you do the repair by the book. Now, what happens if there isn't a procedure or uh, uh, something written uh, from the OE about this particular th thing you're doing? So what we'll do is um, our shop has a account with all data, which basically pulls from all OE manufacturers, and if not, we could submit a library request if we can't find exactly what they're looking for, and then they will find it for us. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's hard to jump through all the hoops on looking everything up. And if there isn't anything that exists out there, we put it back the way we found it. Mm -hmm. We take the panel off, there's glue here, there's welds here, there's silicon bronze here, there's spot welds here, or you know, there's structural rivets here, we put it back the way we found it, as close as we can to how it came off the assembly line for that particular part. Okay, and I and I assume you're, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Correct. You're doing mm -hmm. it for the safety of the consumer, but often the, in this industry it gets talked about is a liability, right? The John Eagle case, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, uh, uh, but, but, but several high-profile uh, lawsuits where body shops were taken to court uh, and they lost because they did not follow the OEM repair procedures. They didn't have access to them. They didn't follow them, they didn't know they existed, whatever the case, or they did the repair the way the insurer wanted them to do it. Uh, they're getting in trouble for this. And I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's one of the reasons you guys follow the OEM procedures. I've had, um, I've not gotten fights with insurance companies, but like it's a field estimate where they say, hey, you're gonna repair this rail, or hey, you're just replacing this rear body panel and this floor extension, and that's the sheet. Well, the, Procedure says to replace the rear body panel and the floor extension, you have to sacrifice the gussets, the upper rail, the upper part of the floor. And they're like, well, we're not going to pay for that. Then I have our estimator, who will pull the procedure prior, send over the procedure to the insurance company and say, this is my sheet, this is the procedure, please follow accordingly. And they've never had a problem with it. Insurance company's like, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they just agree on the estimate and we continue yeah. on with the repairs. Do you guys have any DRPs? We have many, yeah. many, okay. yes. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Uh, family, again, with your dad. Um, you hear two sides of the story. It's like when families work together, I think people outside the situation who have never worked with family think it's a perfect situation. But oftentimes <laughs> you hear from family members and they say, we fight like cats and dogs. Are you kidding me? Like family fights worse than friends. So like, is it, do you guys ever argue, fight, or is it just like uh, kumbaya and everything's great in the shop and it's wonderful working with your dad? It is, it's it is, good. it is wonderful working yeah. with our dad. We yeah. do argue, but typically it's not about work. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> typically sports, it's not about work. Sports, girls, or whatever. I... My father and I work right next to each other, so it's yeah. typically, it's a, uh, hey, you got your car in my way. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah, it's, yeah. hey, stop creeping over with yeah. your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> See, he probably misses doing that when you live with him. Yeah. So yeah, right. yeah. he needs that. It's like a guttural need. Yeah. Ah, but work-wise, we don't really bicker or argue that much because yeah. the three of us are all on the same page. Yeah. Same. We have the same work mind, so we're all yeah. on the same page together. And like um, our coworkers will ask us for help. Oh, my. This is <laughs> yeah. Our one coworker, she asked us for help using our Spinezy Touch measuring system, and she was putting the rear frame section in an F-150 from, like, um, the rear diff back. 
and she wanted help setting it up where it's second set of hands. So we go over there and we're talking. And we had a conversation we, <laughs> with very little words, but we knew exactly what we were talking we were, yeah, about. We were, both, yeah. we were both like, I'm going to do this. And he's like, okay, now it's going to do that. And yeah. nothing was said. And she's yeah. just like, what are you guys doing? And we're just like, <laughs> yeah, we got this. We're good. It's like telepathy. Yeah, you guys are much. on the same page. Wow. Do you ever get like honked off if, if somebody goes to one of you and not all of you for advice, like go to Do Vince or go to Dominic or go to your father? Or do you ever get jealous and like, wait, why didn't they no. come to me? No. We all, we all have our own strengths too. Yes. So like, yeah. like I said earlier, the door handle guy, they're going to come to me. Something structural. Something they're structural gonna come to come to me. Yeah. yeah. And for Tony, it's, it's um, he does a lot, a lot of plastic repair. Yes. Yeah. And like, he is phenomenally phenomenal. fast at it. Yeah. So um, they'll come to him on on plastic repairs. Um, a lot of heavy, a lot of heavy hits that are everything's repairable, mm -hmm. but it's just like, ooh, some people are going to struggle with this. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't it doesn't warrant replacing the parts, but some people who don't know how to move the metal mm -hmm. back to its original place, they're like, mm -hmm. hey Tony, he's like, oh yeah, I got this. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. he makes it look easy. And he makes it look yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah. And especially getting everything to fit up, mm -hmm. stuff that's really, really hit hard, suede, diamond. I mean, he's the guy. Diamond and trucks, yeah. you look at it, you'll spend two hours setting it up and figuring out how to pull it and making it measure and getting it in spec, and he was done 45 minutes yeah. ago. Wow. From start to finish. Wow. Because he grew up on full frames. Yeah. ADOS and diagnostics. This industry is looking at people your age to do this work because they feel like you guys, you know, you grew up with video games and smartphones and laptops and whatnot uh, and social media and you have the computer skills to handle this, whereas the older generation doesn't. Is that a fair assessment of your generation? And uh, do you guys have any of those type of skills where your shop is looking at you to possibly take on ADAS calibrations, scanning, and whatnot? We do do ADAS and calibrations internally unless it requires troubleshooting that um, the equipment we have in-house in cannot do it, and then we call ADAS and they either walk us through it or we send it to them. Mm -hmm. um, but for the younger guys in the shop, yes, we are asked. We don't do this the scanning and the calibrations ourselves. We mm -hmm. have, um, there are our manager and the guy in charge of calibrations. Like, we don't program them. We will leave it set up for him, but we will make sure the BSM blind spot module is at the correct angle, or if we think it's good before, if it's a new bracket that has to be welded on, or it's a new module, or the wire harness repair, or anything mm -hmm. like that, we ask the guy doing the scanning, hey, before I go crazy finishing this whole car and hiding the module behind the bumper and yeah. getting everything in, inaccessible for you, can you come over and let me know? He comes over, scans it. Hey, you gotta, it's got to be tipped half a degree or mm -hmm. you're good to go. All your codes are cleared. And mm -hmm. You finish the car. Wow, because it is a different world today, right? So every repair that comes in, you have to think about the electronics in the car, mm -hmm. the sensors and the modules and all the stuff that's behind the sheet metal, right? It's It's... Mm -hmm. It's a mentality that you didn't used to have before. And I'm assuming you guys, as young as you are, have, have, have grown up with that. And it's just, as soon as you started fixing cars, you had to f consider that stuff. Um, the ADAS and the BSMs, for me, has been newer in the last five, six years. When the, but now it's like almost in every single vehicle. Mm -hmm. But yeah, now it takes a lot in the consideration of the repair. Um, and most of that is found out in triage yeah. with a pre-scan you know, hey, the BSM is messed up or, you know, it's not calibrating because of X, Y, and Z because of the damage or um, something needs to be replaced. So when they write the sheet, they figure out what needs to be replaced, replace it, and they make notes on their cover sheet saying, hey, this is what's going on with the BSM or the ADAS, so you know going ahead, this is where we need to be. And it helps a lot instead of you put the car together and then you're taking it back apart because... right. Sometimes they need to have the numbers off the new module and compare it to the numbers on the old module and then tell the scanner, these are the new numbers so it can program properly. 
What do your coworkers think of your the family situation? And what do you so what does your family outside the shop think of you guys working together? I think everybody is kind of kind of likes it, you know. I mean, yeah. We 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 get along really well, and um, like my dad says, sometimes when you know somebody asks them. What's it like working with your kids? He goes, it's, it's like Father's Day every day. I get mm -hmm. to hang out with my kids. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Like the only other comparison we can make is um, we have a paint team. It's a father-son paint team. And their hit the, the father's nephew is their prepper. I'm sure it's the same thing for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He sprays with his son every single day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you can't beat that. Yeah. Every day. Like, I don't. we don't live at home anymore. You know, I see my mom once or twice a week. I see my dad for 10, 11 hours a day, every, every day. single day, because <laughs> we work together. Yeah. What did, what did your dad tell you or about his, what he did? Did he encourage you to get in the industry? Because I've heard two stories out there. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of collision businesses are, are family owned, and they, they pridefully hand on the shop to the next generation, and, and the kids do want to take, um, take the shop into the future. I've also heard of, of guys saying, you know, I'm going to tell my kids to run as fast as I can the other way from this profession. <laughs> what did your dad tell you about his job? And did he encourage you to, to do collision repair? He didn't encourage us. Um, he always said he would support whatever our decision was with our careers and or whatever we wanted to do in our future. Yeah. When we graduate high school, if you wanted to go to college, I'll help you with college, whatever you want to do. So um, for me, I went to... Try see the local community college for a semester, two classes, and I was working at the shop as a quarter, part time. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, I can do this. I I see the type of money that can be made here, and you know, I just got to learn and grow. And so I started looking at Ohio Technical College, and he's like, Oh, well, let's go take a look. And we went there and we looked, and he's just like, Instead of paying for it, I will teach you on the job. If this is what you want to do, I'll teach you on the job. And our manager approved it, and he's like, okay. And I just learned day by day, and I was fresh. I mean, the only thing I ever learned on cars growing up was how to sand a bumper for paint, yep. how to scuff a bumper. That's the only thing I knew how to do. I think it's interesting that you mentioned earlier that the young people looking at the automotive industry as a potential career have to understand, they have to be patient and wanting to learn and develop and grow. Because I think that, unfairly, that I think that the Generation Z and the Millennials are stereotyped as wanting everything now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They want to be the president, the VP tomorrow. Yeah. But I think previous generations were also, being, were also accused of that. And um, I look at my own career and, you know, I wanted to write for Sports Illustrated when I started this business uh, years ago when I, when I started as an intern. But I realized I didn't have the skills to do that. It was going to take a lot of time. And I actually reached out to Sports Illustrated, and they said, you're going to be a fact checker to start. So what's that? Like, you're going to check the stories of the writers. I go, I want to write. I want to write the stories. Um, so I, I think that that's a good lesson there, is that no matter what career you end up, whether you're an accountant or a, a rocket scientist or a biologist or a collision repairer, it's going to take time to, to grow and develop and evolve and get promoted, and you're going to have to learn and have an open mind, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Um, a lot of the younger kids that come in, they see, like, uh, what Vince will do or what I'll do or what my father will do, and um, they'll want to do that right away. You know, they, I want to do that big hit. I want to do that uh, aluminum repair. I want to do, you know, that full-frame job. And uh, it's, you know, you really have to pay your dues Yes. To learn the skills, to be proficient at the big jobs, to be able to be successful with it. Yeah. Um, if you come in thinking, I'm going to make a lot of money. If you're young, fresh, green, I'm going to make a lot of money. All you're going to do is you're going to cut corners. And it's going to come back to bite you. It may not come back to bite you in a month, yeah. in three months, but that car is going to come back with a problem. And yeah. then guess what? You're fixing it for free. And now you're not making any money because you're losing money on the jobs you're supposed to be working on to fix the problem that you created right. months ago. So um, we, it's actually a funny story, back in our old shop, we didn't have an in-house mechanic. So we did all of our own mechanicals minus the alignment and wheels and tires. We sent that stuff out because we didn't have the equipment at the time. We would do our own frame swaps, full truck frame swaps. So, and 
due to the the weight of everything I'm going to call it, you know, the weight of the knees, the rear differential, you always require a second set of hands. So we line up to do a frame swap together. I come in at like, I don't know, 7 o'clock, I got it on the lift, I rip the cooling unit out, get the cab off. We set the frame up at 10 on two mid-rise lifts, and we go to lunch. We come back to lunch at 1 o'clock. And then when we come back, <laughs> we have a peanut gallery is watching us do this frame. We didn't, we didn't say a word to each other. Yeah. We swapped the frame, had it back under the cab by 3 o'clock. <laughs> Everyone's just like, what did you just do? Yeah, yeah. We're but, just, it's bolts. Yeah, and that being said, that, that wasn't our first rodeo. That was not I our mean, first we, rodeo. We were doing frame swaps for quite a while before that. I think that was probably my 10th or 11th frame swap at the time. Yeah. Wow. There was one time I did three frame swaps in a month. It's just the luck of the draw, the, yeah. the hits that came yeah. in. Yeah, It's We had a weird wave. Sometimes it's... Oh, all bumpers or all yeah. quarter panels. Yeah. I mean, it varies. And you're just like, oh, look, there's a bedside. Two weeks later, hey, there's six more bedsides. Yeah. yeah. And we just yeah. don't know why, but that's just how it is. Uh, what's it been like since COVID? Because I say be, be, uh, since COVID because it seems like body shots have been slammed with work. We've heard mm -hmm. anywhere from two-week to six-week backlogs. I was talking to a guy in Idaho today yeah. who said the average backlog is is five months up. In, in the state, it's it's, it's insane, and it's, there's a lot of reasons: the part shortage and the, the labor shortage. How's it like been for you guys in your shop and, and your work schedules and whatnot? Um, my work schedule, our work schedule, hasn't really changed. We have seen a a slight influx since COVID because a lot of the small mom and pop shops closed during Weren't COVID, and they couldn't enable, it. they couldn't make it through it, or they couldn't mm -hmm. pay their employees, and mm -hmm. this and that. Luckily, our owner was able to um, make sure we were getting paid and still, we still had a job. You know, we were still able to have healthcare and all that stuff that we needed. So he made sure we didn't close. And so a lot of the smaller shops got absorbed by the bigger shops like we are. And we've seen a constant workflow. Our backlog, I'm not sure what our backlog is, but for the most part with our DRPs, we're scheduled pretty well. We have seen parts shortages. It's getting better. It's getting way better. It's getting way better. Mopar is still an issue, okay. but um, it's much better than it used to be. I know in a few years ago, a GM, I mean, we work for GM, and it's just like, I can't get this cruise headlight that there's <laughs> 7 million of them on the road. I still can't get this headlight for six months. So what does the future hold for you guys? I mean, do you envision yourselves retiring from this industry do, do you think maybe one day you'll try, uh, you go to the oil fields or maybe <laughs> carpentry or, I mean, it seems like some guys get lured away by money or for whatever reason, uh, maybe it's the, the bull they have to deal with from insurers or whatever the case may be. Um, what does future hold for you and, and how long do you think you'll be working with dads? Our father will hopefully and luckily be retired in about 12 to 15 months. Um, for us... Does the shop know this? Yes, the shop knows <laughs> this. Okay. <laughs> the joke is, hey, when you retire, your boy's going to stay? Yeah. <laughs> they going with you? That's the you got to do the work of three guys yeah, when he retires, right? right? Um, but I don't know if I would um, retire at the shop from 65, but I don't see myself going anywhere in this industry. I'm going to stay doing what I'm doing. And if down the road my body can't keep up, you know, everything hurts after a while, then I will do something else in the industry because why would I go start something new when the knowledge is already there? Right. I don't have the connections with the insurance company, but I can write an estimate. I know mm -hmm. how to write the repairs and make sure everything's done right. It's just learning the computer end, which is yeah. not that big of a learning curve. How about you, Dominic? Um, I just wanted to add that, um, like for the younger guys coming into the industry too, uh, starting out, cutting your teeth, fixing cars. Um, you know, if that didn't work out for you, there's also always office uh, jobs that you could transition into because you've gained that knowledge on the floor. You know, you've gained that knowledge with the parts and how to write the estimates and how to work with the insurance company. Right. Estimating or uh, detailing mm -hmm. or parts going going to the dark side. And there's sometimes if they go to the insurance and companies, the insurance, and then yeah. they, yeah. sometimes they come back. Exactly. You, know? uh, you never know. But... We've had so, a couple guys who came in green, not learning. They came in as porters or detailers, and 
the one guy came in. He's the assistant parts manager, and oh yeah, our parts man, part would he does a great fail job. without him. Yeah. yeah, that's a big job. He yeah. has it down to a science, and yeah. I'm just like, for me, I'm like, how do you how do you keep up with this? Yeah, it's there's a lot of options for people who want to come into the industry and learn different parts of the of the um, industry. That's not just doing collision repair. Well, I really want to thank you guys for showing up today. Um, you know, it's awesome that you're not too far away, Middleburg Heights, suburb of Cleveland. How far was the drive today? 35 minutes. Awesome. Yeah, See? Not bad. So, not bad at all. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. It was such a pleasure that, to meet you again. Uh, again, when I went to the open house, I was blown away by you guys. I mean, just, and it was just amazing to me that you guys were all family working together. I'm sure there's another situation out there like that, but I, I think it's pretty rare that you have dad and two sons working together. That's pretty cool. So thank you for coming in today. Thank you for, Thanks having, for us. having us. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out BodyShopBusiness.com for more podcasts.